you just want to decrease it. You just want the growth in your head to be smaller. If you language it to yourself as I've got this thing talking in my head and I would like it to stop it. I would like it to quiet down and I'm going to practice self-inquiry. I'm going to practice meditation. Personally, I find it more convincing than just thinking, you know, oh, there's these thoughts in my head and maybe they'll go away. Well, and you can, as you begin self-inquiry, if you're diligent at doing it, you can find things getting better very, very quickly. It's not like nothing happens for 10,000 hours and then you get a flash of lightning. Uh, you can see your life getting better. You're less conflicted. You're less constricted in your life as you walk through, work with people, talk to them. You see yourself reacting in a different way, less extremely than before. So you can see your behavior modifying as you begin to just question, is this I a real thing? Just try to look at it. And along the way, you may find, as somebody mentioned earlier, that, you know, the brain's kind of taken over. The brain kind of finds out what it likes in all this stuff, and it will begin to do this process itself. You know, we like to think we're in charge of this process, but in reality, you know, we don't have any, don't have a clue what the brain is doing right now as we sit here. We have no way to interrogate it, watch it, understand it. We don't know what the neurons are doing. We don't know what the chemicals are doing. We're just sitting here on top of this giant processor elephant. It's a little tiny rider, believing we're somehow in control. But the brain's running this show. If we give it enough data, like we're just talking about, uh, it will find a way to work this problem out. And they're pretty routine about it. They're, uh, they, they all solve the problem the same way, pretty much. Wonderful. Um, should I come in with a question now, you guys? Go ahead. All right. Um, I have one from Katie, and I'm going to read it for her. She asks, um, my question is, what's the difference between repressing thoughts and accepting and letting them go in meditation practice? Well, you can do both. I mean, you, you, you can... There, you, you can um, Watch thoughts very carefully, and you can even, there's an exercise called uh, Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. The idea being, if you watch very carefully as thoughts arise, if you watch carefully enough, you can stop the thoughts. You can really stop them in their track. This is not easy to do, but you can stop every thought before it arises. So that's stopping them. You can also try other suppressive techniques to block them out with, with different energy, different kind of processes you can do, different exercises you can do to just shut them down. And that's basically what we do with our activities. And a lot of our um, tasks that we do are really done so that we can block out thoughts being there. It's kind of an artificial way, but we like to do solve problems or do poems or do writing or do exercises because while we're doing those things, a whole other circuit's involved and the blah, blah circuit is not operating. So we've learned how to do that. And a lot of our uh, pursuits that we undertake are really ways to shut up the blah, blah, without even thinking that we're shutting it up. We're just busy doing something else. We like the something else because it doesn't have the blah, blah. We just don't see that transition to the place. But you can also, uh, instead of uh, repressing the thoughts or freezing the thoughts, just look and see where they're coming from. And that would probably uh, be the difference between this kind of notion of the acceptance of them and letting them go and the repression of them. If we, for example, take this idea of the I, this thought of the I, and then we actually look for it in meditation. If you look and see who's meditating, um, that has a different feel and a different effect than, say, another technique, which is, you know, you visualize, say, a pond, and then the thoughts are fish. And anytime there's a fish in that pond, hope, you gobble a fish, right? That's an erasure of the thought. But I find that that reaches its limit and that really looking for the source of thoughts, looking for where they come from, is where it gets the deep stillness really resides. Yeah, I'd say the problem with accepting thoughts, there are many traditions that posit no thoughts as the objective of meditation. 
other traditions say, pay no attention to the thoughts. You know, don't even worry about them. Just don't concern yourself at all about them, which to me is the Wizard of Oz approach, which is just pay no attention to the man behind the screen. And there is this, this uh, deep hope within those traditions that, in fact, just somehow the thoughts will go away by themselves. That hasn't been my experience. I mean, unless you somehow, you can do it as Rich said, subtly, but unless you somehow actively engage a process to deconstruct the I, simply ignoring your thoughts and hoping they won't bother you doesn't work. You'll be sitting there for a long, long time waiting for Godot, and the Godot never arrives. You just sit there and hide away from your thoughts for a long time and just pay no attention to the man behind the screen. I do think it's interesting that in many uh, shamanic traditions, for example, if a... Uh, negative entity is to uh, arrive on the scene, as it were. One of the techniques is always to ask it who sent it, right? And this is more or less the technique with thoughts, like, well, who sent you, right? Where did you come from? And then it kind of dissolves. And that's an acceptance of sorts because you say, oh, hello. But then you let it go because you're looking for who sent it and who sent it was, you know, source. So you can get to source. Yeah, another technique that's in the blogs and everything is Sedona technique, which is another uh, add-on to Byron Katie's technique. And this one is just very simply, you observe this thing that's arisen, and you say, well, could I let go of this? And it, again, is a very tactile thing. You feel your way into that particular problem, thought, memory, story, whatever, and say, could I let go of this thing? And you can feel inside yourself what the answer to that is. And then the next question, a little more uncertainty, is would I let go? So it really served me, is it helpful to me to have this, this thing around, this memory story, whatever. And then the third one is, well, even if you say, no, I couldn't let go of this thing. No, it's very important to me. I won't let go of it now. You say, well, when could you let go of it? Someday in the future. You say, well, never. I have to have this thing around for the rest of my life. It's really, I love the thing that's going to be here. Even if you say no, no, never, it turns out the brain has to compare them. I mean, the very fact that you entertain the possibility that you could let go of something, the brain has to run a comparison. It has to say, well, oh, oh, I could let go of this thing. It may not have done that before, but it now has the opportunity, the requirement actually, to look at those two together and kind of balance them back and forth. Just by doing that comparison, trying to set a date, we find the whole network does weaken. Depending upon how willing you are to let go, you can really let go of these attachments, these problematic things you have. So amazingly, it works to just say, I let go of this thing. I don't need it. I want rid of it now. It can fall away. The big ones may take a couple of visitations. The little ones can go very quickly. Again, a heuristic can develop. Could I, would I, when? It happens very quickly. People who are good at this thing and do it a lot, it happens almost instantaneously. It's a very effective letting go technique. You can say you're accepting them in, and you're now saying, I'll look at this, and could I let go of it? Wow, that's very cool. <laughs> um, it seems so easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's surprisingly easy, and it's, and it's the hardest thing, and this is really founded in Jungian psychotherapy. I mean, the, the, the interesting thing is, it's, it is so easy. People can't believe it's that easy. You mean just by having this dragon, this fire-breathing dragon in and say, oh, could I let go of this? And you say, well, I, you know, you're the one holding on to this one. There's no stone tablet in place that says you have to keep this horrible thing in your consciousness. It's there for some protective reason. You stored it some time ago because you believed it would protect you from harm. That may have been 25 years ago. It may have no validity whatsoever. It's just an old story you're running. You can let go of it. You really can just let go of it. Just like you let go of a leaf. It can just fall out of your hand and go away. And because, precisely because it doesn't reside anywhere else, but in consciousness, yeah, it's, all, it's all endogenous. There's no other place it is except in your consciousness. There's no other place you have to let go from. It's your whole, it's your possession, and you can just say, I don't want this anymore, and let go of it. And you can feel if you're holding on to it, 
just exactly why you're holding on. You can feel the texture underneath the one when you say, no, I won't let go of this thing. You can feel your way into the texture underneath that thing, and you can feel the fear there. It may be two or three layers of fear, which you can feel yourself down into that, and you can let go of those layers, and it will go away. Wow. Super cool. For example, I have the word alone written down here. Uh, you know, a, a, a deep one that I didn't think I could let go of was this kind of feeling of being alone. You know, like you might imagine that for a lot of my life, I felt kind of like a mutant, you know, <laughs> like a stranger in a strange land. I think we all do to a certain point. And there was the kind of story in, in me that I couldn't accept that. I don't know where it came from, you know, maybe when I was a child and I was alone and it, it felt, I thought, frightening, you know. And being alone was something that uh, just, you know, there was no possible way in which I could accept. Um, and I get this now from a lot of people that I talk to that they get to a certain point of stillness and they say, OMG, I feel so alone. Not because there aren't other people around. There are other people around. But once that kind of chatter goes down, you kind of start to feel the oneness, meaning that you're all by yourself in a certain way. And uh, there's a story there associated with being alone where you feel that kind of referential alone. I'm alone in the world. I am exposed. I am not with mommy, daddy. I am not with lover, right? But that story is what comes in in order to sort of cover over the power there that if you really just feel what that feels like to be alone, then you kind of are empowered by it. There's a kind of extraordinary strength in feeling your own uniqueness. And that's what you're really feeling that your then narrative mind tells a story of as like, you're alone. It's like, no, I am unique. I am. I am an aspect of the world being one. And that process that Gary uh, talked about, not only self-inquiry, but the Brian Katie and the Sedona method, you can get to that. Like that one probably feels for a lot of people like a really nervy one, you know, that really, can I really face Aloneness? Absolutely. It isn't anywhere else, but in your own consciousness, all you need to, it's, it's not that complicated. You just have to actually be with it. And as Gary said, the miraculous thing is you don't have to be some courageous superhero and answer yes to all, all, all the questions. Even if you say, you know what? No, I just can't. I can't be alone. You know, I, I need this kind of fundamental contact with reality uh, and, and other people. Your brain goes off and starts doing the comparison and all of a sudden it's a possibility. And then guess what? What you were afraid of was not really being alone. You were afraid of your response to being alone. And you can feel the strength there actually in your solitude. Uh, I know that's not a popular one, but that's why I brought it out. Yeah, and the other side of is alone is you become all one. Yeah. And what's happening inside the brain, we have a very good understanding now of what neural circuits generate the sense of an I, a sense of selfing. There's 11 centers and there are two main core nodes. And there are two side networks. And those two side networks, one of them generates the sense of you in time. You as a creature who lived in the past and is going to live in the future. The other circuit creates a sense of you and others. And as the brain begins to disassemble this circuit, we do inquiry in Sedona, letting go, and Byron Katie inquiry and such, you find that in fact the eye starts to disintegrate. And this network starts to become not so coherent, not so strongly held together. And what happens is the brain, you're beginning to feel this sense of this me and other begin to fall away. And you get this seeing of, oh, you know, it's not so clear the line between me and others. It's kind of like they're more like me. 
and it becomes you're moving towards the brain's moving faster than what you are towards all is one, which is one of the great mystical experiences, one of the great pharmaceutical experiences. And the other one is this now, now, now. The circuit that creates you going through time also is breaking up. And as it, as it breaks up, you have this sense of only being now. So you're only now, 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 and you're only one. You are all, everything is one thing. You are all one. And that's what moves from alone into all being one. You're just naturally deconstructing those two networks that cause those phenomena to be there, to manifest. Wow. <laughs> uh, great. Um, Katie was thanking you for the, the thoughtful response to her question about respe repressed emotions, and that was really amazing. I don't